Thank you.
my peace be kept. Give me thy presence, and my baby.
Good evening. I'm the Reverend Laura Nye, Director of Trinity Episcopal Church in Iowa City. On behalf of the clergy, vestry, and parishioners of Trinity, I welcome you to our celebration of the Eucharist on Christmas Eve 2020. This year, our celebration is very different from previous years. We are apart from one another. And the joy this season brings exists alongside the knowledge that throughout the world, terrible suffering continues, staggering loss of life, frightening economic hardship, and the sorrow of agreement. The story of Jesus' birth is a story of hope. We cling to that hope and pray that God will bring health and peace of mind to those who struggle in this season. Thank you for joining us for the Eucharist this evening. Let's have Christmas to you and those you love.
Blessed are you, holy and living one. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, who made this most holy night to shine with the brightness of your one true light, bring us who have known the revelation of that light on earth to see the radiance of your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. 
Those who live in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Let the heavens
A reading from the letter to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. 
This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Gospel of our Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Americans are quirky when it comes to mixing religion and politics. Our country's founding documents decree that government will not favor one religion over another, and they give us the right to practice the religion of our choice. Later legal opinions and pronouncements by those who claim religious authority have muddied those waters. Christianity exercised cultural dominance for a long time, but its claims are questioned as our nation's population grows steadily more diverse and steadily less connected to any organized religion. Those challenges have provoked both backlash and claims by American Christians that they are being persecuted. Throughout our nation's lifespan, religious institutions have been associated both with the struggle for civil and human rights and the oppression and mistreatment of marginalized groups and persons. Plenty of Americans will claim that religion is a private matter. Plenty of others will claim that God's will is at work in one exercise of political power or another. The people whose stories are told in the Bible lived in very different circumstances. For them, religion was not separate from ethnicity, geography, and civic life. That linkage was so profound that Bible stories do not mention it or if they do, they reference geography or ethnic identity with implied reference to religion. There's no need to remind people of something that is second nature to them. But it means that we latter day readers miss elements of those stories that are important. We don't see challenges to the ways of the world in the subtext of the stories of Jesus's birth in Luke and Matthew. There have been attempts to draw elements of them into the modern era, things like describing Mary's so-called crisis pregnancy or characterizing Jesus's family as homeless when they find themselves in Bethlehem without a place to stay. But Luke's challenges to the ways of the world, both in first and 21st centuries, are theological and moral in the same way that those of the Israelite prophets are. They confront the false gods of power and greed and pose the question, where are divine presence and power truly to be found? Luke is a skilled writer and a master storyteller. He knows the Greco-Roman world and the ways that empire has shaped it. As with all stories, context is critical to understanding Luke. What does his story have in common with things that were happening in the time of the events it describes? Those surrounding events are central to the challenge and the questions Luke poses. In his story of Jesus's birth, he shows us two worldviews side by side and invites us to choose between their respective theologies. At the time of Jesus's birth, Judea, where the story takes place, was conquered territory. Its people had risen up against Rome more than once, 
only to suffer brutal punishment. One of those uprisings, an armed insurrection of Jews against Rome, occurred in response to a census declared by the emperor. In an ancient empire, the purpose of a census was to assure that all persons subject to taxation were identified and counted. We think of taxes as supporting the work of government and essential services. Taxes levied on people living under Roman occupation were used to enrich the Roman elite. The census declared by the Emperor Augustus in Luke's narrative is described as a count of all the people in the world. Luke means for that to be ironic. The world that is to be counted is the realm of Augustus. He sees himself as its benefactor, not an oppressive conqueror. The people who live in that world see it differently. Luke's irony is that this census, which is an ostentatious display of imperial power, sets in motion the birth of the Messiah who will liberate Israel and all the nations from oppression. Luke does not stop there. Throughout the empire, in Luke's time and to this day, there are monuments inscribed with the praises of the Emperor Augustus. The Roman coins in circulation during his reign were inscribed with his likeness and the words, Son of God. He shared that title with the Israelite kings, David and Solomon, and eventually with Jesus. One of those monuments to Augustus references the day of his birth as the beginning of a new era, and his assumption of the monarchy as an event that brought good news and glad tidings to the world. The inscriptions describe him as a savior of his people who would end war and bring prosperity. Luke describes Joseph making the journey with Mary to Bethlehem, the home city of his ancestors, who include King David. It is David in whose likeness the hope for Israel's liberator has been shaped through the centuries. Upon their arrival there, we learn that Joseph and Mary can find no human habitation in the town crowded with travelers. They shelter in a stable, and in these makeshift accommodations, the child is born. In the surrounding countryside, Luke describes shepherds quietly at work in the night, guarding their flocks. It's hard to imagine an earthier or more humble setting. Into it, Luke introduces a spectacle of supernatural splendor that even Augustus cannot rival. The messengers of God use the language of imperial propaganda found on those monuments to Augustus to introduce Jesus to a handful of shepherds to whom they impart good news of great joy for all the people, the birth of a savior, glory to God and peace on earth. We've been encouraged to see the pathos and the romance in this story and let it go with that. Luke's story has sharper edges than we acknowledge. Our attention to particular elements of it has been shaped by church tradition that developed long after Luke's lifetime. We have difficulty bending its supernatural elements into stricter categories of fact and fiction than troubled the ancients. They had no problem telling those two things apart, but they may have been more at ease with different ways in which something can be true than we are. However, this story and the church's interpretation of it may have evolved over two millennia, Luke poses a question that is worthy of our attention. Where are divine power and presence really found? Do we see divine power and presence in the Emperor Augustus and his type, or in Jesus? Does the power of God lie in military might, or in the death of one who refuses to be intimidated by threats? Is it found in the ability to annihilate, or the courage to face annihilation with faith? The desire and ability to destroy enemies, or the willingness to forgive? enemies? Is it the way of God to take because we can, to claim that we deserve more than others, or to live by giving, to drain the poor economically, 
or to build a world in which everyone's needs can be met? Does divine presence lie in the ability to control, coerce, and instill fear, or to lead by persuasion and example? Is peace to be imposed through a show of strength and the exercise of force, or in the endurance of oppression and ultimate restoration of justice? Jesus answers these questions for us. The, cha the answers challenge the affluence and privilege that we've become accustomed to, and we struggle with them, but they are at the heart of what we celebrate on this most holy night. In a fearsome time of division and inequality, they show us a way forward. Amen. We continue with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask for your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our presiding Bishop Michael, for our Bishop Allen, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, especially Anne, Tam, Anne, Laura, Charles, Beverly, Del, Stacy, Brian, Robert, Chris, Sarah, Art, Paul, Donna, Christine and Tim, Ruth, Dave, and Louise. For the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. For those who are affected by natural disasters, that their communities can rebuild in a spirit of optimism and cooperation, that they will have the resources they need to recover from injury, restore property, and rebuild community. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed and those who have died from COVID-19. 
Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those in our parish prayer cycle, especially George Wilson, Carol Winter, and Marsha Wonder. We give thanks with those celebrating anniversaries of birth, especially Scarlett Carino Merritt, Evelyn Papworth, Ann Tanner, Amber Capps, Birgit Kaufman, Janice Piltingsrud, Jean Littlejohn, Ann Stapleton, Jeffrey Berner, and Margaret Smolin. We give thanks with those celebrating anniversaries of marriage, especially Kirk and Miriam Timmer Hacker, Anna and Jeremy Manchinat, and Meg and William Furlong. We pray for those preparing for holy orders, especially Betsy McElroy and Nora Berner. We give thanks with those celebrating anniversaries of sobriety. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have the grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you.
God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them, O Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Holy One, and to give you thanks, for you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of light and source of all goodness, you made all things and fill them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we say. you, holy God, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Holy God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, Jesus gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, your own first gift for those who believe, to complete your work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Almighty God, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming Christ's resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting Christ's coming in glory and offering to you from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you. We bless you. We give thanks to you 
and we pray to you, Lord, our God. God, our creator, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with Blessed Mary, Mother of our Lord, with matriarchs, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray together the prayer of spiritual communion. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church, for your blessed body and blood are offered this day, and remembering particularly this congregation assembled for worship today, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life for the redemption won for us by your life, death, resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. And since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen.
May Almighty God, who sent his Son to take our nature upon him, bless you in this holy season. Scatter the darkness of sin and brighten your heart with the light of his holiness. May God, who sent his angels to proclaim the glad news of the Savior's birth, fill you with joy and make you heralds of the gospel. May God, who in the word made flesh, joined heaven to earth and earth to heaven, give you his peace and favor. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.